Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I am your host, Jackson Rudolph, and this is episode 56, brought to you by the one and only Black Belt Magazine. And you will notice that we are back in the archives again today, not in the studio like normal, because it is a film study episode. We're going to be going back through some sport karate history videos and some videos that are a little bit more recent, because today is a viewer submitted film study episode. Now, what that means is that not every single video that got submitted I'm going to be reviewing. What happens when I do episodes, uh, because I am going to be doing more of these in the future that are viewer submitted, what happens is, is through social media, Facebook, Instagram, even a couple, of, uh, a couple of people reaching out to me privately saying, hey, we want to see this performance or that performance. I select a select few of those. Um, and then from those few that I select, I kind of uh, add in videos of my own, not videos of myself, but videos that I select myself. Um, so that there's kind of a consistent flow to um, the path through sport karate history that we're taking today um, or in that given episode. So with the first video that we're going to watch today, we're actually going to watch something a little bit more recent. We're going to be checking out uh, Jake Presley from the Hungarian World Cup in 2017. And that's going to take us down a little rabbit hole of sport karate history, where we don't necessarily just focus on the Hungarian World Cup. In film study episodes before, we've discussed the French Open and the Irish Open and other European events, but we're actually going to dive down a rabbit hole of the Austrian classics uh, and be going through some of the performances that the Team Paul Mitchell members have had over the years, uh, going over to the Austrian classics and competing there uh, with some point fighting content as well. It's not just going to be the forms and weapons, um, and then we're just going to continue to kind of flow through the episode from there. So not every video that got submitted is going to be covered today, but promise hang in there. Uh, we're going to have a great episode and we're going to be looking at a lot of really awesome uh, sport karate content throughout the show today. So we're going to go ahead and get started with this routine of Mr. Jake Presley's been a teammate of mine for, for several years now. I got on uh, Paul Mitchell in 2012 Jake may have gotten on in 2016, I want to say. Um, don't quote me on that. Jake, if you're tuning in, go ahead and drop down in the comments what year you got added to the team. Uh, so this is him competing at the Hungarian Kickboxing World Cup. Um, so Paul Mitchell frequently flies out competitors overseas to Europe um, in order to help spread forms and weapons competition over there. Uh, as many of you know that are fans of sport karate, point fighting and kickboxing is extremely well established uh, over in Europe through WACO, the World Association of Kickboxing Organizations. They've done an incredible job with that. Uh, but forms and weapons isn't as popular. They have some great, really talented forms and weapons competitors, uh, but the division size is just aren't nearly as big as they are here in America. And so Team Paul Mitchell will go overseas uh, to help spread forms and weapons uh, to Europe. And we teach seminars. As you see here, Jake's already getting the crowd into it a little bit uh, because that's really what these forms are all about is just entertaining and showing people uh, what we do over in America in terms of uh, forms and weapons competition. So we see Jake showing off his signature speed at the beginning here. I love that combo, the 540 catch to the left-handed flick to the box cutter. Uh, Jake performs that really, really well. Uh, sometimes he double spins that box cutter, which he could have done there, but he's just trying to make sure that he hits this form here. Vertical zero gravity, beautiful, still at good speed. He does typically 720 that one in American competition, but again, just for demonstration, that was a 360. He goes over into the, uh, the Uranus because of the axis of rotation there. It's part of the orbiter series of moves. For those of you that uh, that aren't familiar with your uh, with your astronomy, um, Uranus has rings that run vertically, unlike Saturn that has rings that run kind of diagonally or horizontally. Um, Uranus's rings, actually, or Uranus, however you pronounce it, um, their rings actually run vertically. So Jake throwing the bow over his head like that, uh, that's a move that is called Uranus. And now we're going to go ahead and switch over. By the way, thank you to Brandman Dan for, uh, for a lot of these videos that are be, going to be coming over from Europe. Uh, he does an incredible job of kind of covering all of the European events over there. Uh, and here we go. So now we're actually going to shift into some point fighting. I'm going to pause this right here at the beginning just to kind of set the scene here. So when I watched that video, Jake, at Hungarian Open, I was like, you know what? We've never done anything from the Austrian classics on the show uh, because, you know, members of Team Paul Mitchell and, and other Americans haven't really been to the Austrian Classics um, since I think 2013 was one of the more recent years. Obviously, I'm sure that fighters still go over. Uh, but as far as forms and weapons competitors from America, we haven't um, been going to that event in recent memory. Um, and so when I was searching the Austrian Classics, originally just looking for some of the old school uh, forms and weapons videos from their old school, meaning anything that's kind of like over a decade old. Um, 
I've stumbled upon this because I have, uh, I've always been a fan of the fight between Justin Ortiz and Raymond Daniels that happened at the battle of Atlanta in 2014. I had no idea. They thought they fought at the, uh, at the Austrian classics in 2013. Um, so this is just a, a little entertaining fight to watch. Um, you can see actually both fighters are, are relatively lighthearted uh, throughout this fight here. We see Justin Bouncing getting ready now for this fight. Now Ray automatically going for that signature spin back kick of his lands on the forearms. No point scored there. He's going to try it again right there as Justin loses his balance. Once again, not scoring. Ray is going to change his approach a little bit now, not leaning so much on the spin back kick. That time goes for the uh, the European style back fist to the body. You see both fighters having a laugh about that. Not typically a scoring technique in America, but in Europe, that back fist to the body does score. Um, and that would actually, in that 2014 Battle of Atlanta fight, the, the front hand to the body technique would actually be a point of contention that wound up determining that match. Um, but anyway, so back into this fight. We see J.O. because he's the smaller fighter, Justin Ortiz, moving a lot around the outside of the ring, trying to find his opportunity to throw those kicks. We see him showing the leg there, then he takes off with the hands, and then the, the Raymond countered with the reverse punch. So you see the, uh, the referees calling it both ways there, so a point to each side. Then J.O. answers back with the body punch, tying the score at two to two. J.O. trying to get those kicks going again. He knows that if he can get those kicks going, he can work the spacing with Ray. Ray takes off, it looks like there. No score that time. Right, and then J.O. goes for the step in that time, and we see the glove just come flying off. Um, so, yeah, a lot of kind of weird stuff happens in this fight. We saw uh, Ray trying the two spinning back kicks early, then going to the European-style front hand to the body. Then we see Justin's glove just completely fly off. Um, so kind of an interesting fight in, in the way that things started to play out here. Um, I'm not quite sure what the delay is here. I guess they're giving him maybe an equipment warning for the equipment flying off, not – not really sure what what that big stoppage of, of the fight was there. But anyway, then Justin thinks he lands the kick, but it looks like Ray got the extension on that reverse punch to the body. Ray always going for the flash, tries the tornado kick. Looks like he may have hit Justin a little bit low there. Justin's going to need a second to shake that off a little bit. And then you see it looks like everybody that's left in the arena. This must be uh, close to the end of the day because it's like anybody that was still left in the arena has gathered around uh, to watch this fight between, at the time, two of the best fighters on the planet. Justin was arguably the best lightweight in the world. Everybody knows what Raymond's reputation is, is arguably the greatest point fighting athlete of all time. Um, so this was a very, very high caliber matchup between two very, very skilled fighters at the top of their game. We see J.O. continuing to move around the outside, and there Raymond finally going for that jump spinning back kick. Appears to land it. It's hard to see it from this angle where the camera is because we can see Justin's back. We don't see his front where the technique would have been landing. So I really can't tell from the video if it landed on the forearm, which would not score, or if it landed to the torso, which would score. But the judges say that it did. They also call it a two-pointer because they deem that Raymond was still in the air when he was throwing the kick. Ray goes for the big axe kick there. Lucky for Justin, that misses. But at this point, 13 seconds left. Looks like Ray's going to get another call there. Yeah, it does look like Ray's going to get another call. He's up five to two now. Looks like he's going to be up. <laughs> Justin comes over and looks in the camera, showing his disappointment in the call there. Um, so, yeah, kind of a, a weird way for the fight to come to a close. Kind of a, a weird stoppage with Justin's glove flying off. And then, um, you know, some calls that because of the camera angle, we can't necessarily see. But I think it's obvious that you can tell. And then uh, Justin always the joker there trying to sweep the, uh, the little timer thing out of the way. Uh, but anyway, and always respect between the fighters there at the end you see the embrace between damon gilbert uh the coach fighting coach of team paul mitchell with raymond daniels there um so yeah tons of respect between those fighters and now that's the second time that and as we get a taco bell commercial of course that's the second time that I've shown one of Justin's fights on the podcast. It just so happens that both of those fights were losses to Raymond Daniels, somebody that obviously there's no shame in losing to. Uh, so, J.O., if you're watching this, I want to give you a little bit of redemption here. And we are going to watch the full nine-minute marathon fight uh, that won Justin Ortiz, his lightweight diamond ring back at the 2015 Diamond Nationals, one of the most prestigious sport karate tournaments in the world. Um, and Justin going up against a very formidable opponent here. Um, the newest inductee as the competitor of the year to the Black Belt Magazine Hall of Fame going up against Team All-Stars, Jack Felton. So again, two very, very high caliber lightweight fighters at the top of their game. Uh, and we just get to enjoy a, a nine minute, what I believe was an overtime match. I'm actually uh, going into this without having watched this match. 
since it happened in 2015. I was over there stage side uh, watching this fight take place, and I have not watched this fight since then. And, and one thing before I get into the commentary of what's going on here, just as these fighters start to feel each other out, Justin's trying to work the kicks. We see Justin here with the uh, the one red century boot on. Uh, that's what he calls his hot foot. He shows that uh, that foot being red because it's his hot foot that he scores a lot of his kicks with. Um, and to me, within sport karate, Justin Ortiz with the with the one red foot gear, the one red boot, is the equivalent of like Kobe Bryant biting his jersey, Kyrie Irving with his jersey untucked. Right? It's like one of those classic like hoodie mellow for those of you that know basketball references and, and things of that nature. And to me, Justin with the one red shoe is the equivalent of kind of those athletes when there's a, a particular part of their wardrobe that, that elevates their game to another level. Um, and this is when Justin was at his absolute best. Um, in my opinion, this this was the, the top of Justin's prime here. Um, not to say that he can't still come back and obtain that, but he's doing a lot of work in the stunt industry now and doing some things in entertainment. He owns a school now, so Justin's got a lot of other things going on. But uh, if he wanted to come back and fight at a high level, I know that he could. And so now we're going to actually get into some fight commentary here. We see Justin again kind of circling around the outside, tries to attack off the edge there, and it looks like he gets the score. Center referee Terry Kramer, a legendary point fighter in his own right. And that time it looks like the kick slips in. It looks like Justin was maybe just using that kick to figure out his spacing, but it slipped in and looked like it scored. That, that other kick looked like it went to the hip, but obviously Justin goes to the ground. Looks like he hurt his ankle a little bit. Jack was scoring over the top with the hands there. Um, and yes, Justin did suffer an ankle injury. I believe there was a little bit of a pre-existing ankle injury going into this fight. Uh, I don't recall if this was the first time that that ankle got injured or if this is a re-aggravation of an injury. But I do know, obviously, as, as we see Justin on the ground now, um, there was an ankle injury that occurred. He gets back up. He's bouncing, ready to go. But obviously, that ankle's hurting him. It was hurting him for the rest of that evening. And then showing how healthy that, that ankle must be, he goes for the uh, the big tornado kick. There almost looked like he was going to try to go for a tornado axe kick and drop that over the top. Uh, but Jack, a little bit too experienced, wasn't, uh, wasn't going to allow that to score. Jack comes over the top again. I wish that we could see what the score was, or at least that I had been keeping up with it. Uh, but anyway, so I think that the fight's pretty even at the moment. We see Damon lifting his hands in celebration, thinking Justin scored, but the judges call in Jack's direction. They saw the body punch, I believe. And that'll be the end of the first round. So a lot going on in that first round. Points exchanged either way. I believe that Jack appears to have a slight lead here. Um, and things probably aren't looking good for Justin being down going into the second round and having that ankle injury. Uh, but now going into the second round, we'll see Justin uh, pull off what I believe is a comeback here. I do believe that Jack was ahead, even though obviously we can't see the score. We see judges call in Jack's direction one more time. Justin thought, it, thought that he had that one once again. Justin working the kick, both fighters bouncing, trying to get the timing right. Jack goes to the body, and they call, to, they call it in favor of Jack. So that's another body punch for Jack. Jack's starting to pull away a little bit in this fight, it seems. And then Justin over the top. Now the fight's getting a little bit chippy. Justin getting in Jack's face after that clash there. Uh, doesn't look like a point went Justin's way there, however. And that time, Jack on the step in again. Uh, shakes Justin up a little bit. He's still working that ankle some. And then now Justin's really got to work to get this comeback effort going. I mean, he's definitely down in this fight at this point. We've seen Jack score too many times in a row. And so now Justin's going to have to put together a comeback effort. Scores on the kick there. That's two. Comeback effort has begun. Justin's working his way back into this fight. Moving around the outside. Judges didn't say stop. Uh, looks like Justin had an equipment malfunction. He was trying to call out to Terry Creamer there. Fighters reset. Justin's working that movement again, comes over the top of the back fist. Did the back fist land? Yes, judges call the back fist over the top, it looks like. Either that or maybe it was the follow with the reverse punch after the back fist. Oh, and they switch it. It goes to Jack. A little bit of a, of a judging malfunction there, a little miscount. So Jack scores there. J.O. trying to get those kicks in to pull himself back into this fight. And then huge kick. Oh, looks like Jack might have covered it. Damon seems upset. Damon thought that that kick landed. Justin obviously thought that it landed as well. Judges didn't call it. Another kick from Justin. We can't see it from the camera angle, but those three judges in the back obviously saw it. Head kick for Justin Ortiz. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jack. I <laughs> know, Sam, whoa, like this fight's actually happening in real time, right? Uh, looks like Justin either his ankle buckled there or maybe an equipment malfunction that led to the ankle buckling a bit. 
tried to stop the fight. Jack was going to try to take advantage of that opportunity to score there. But luckily, uh, Terry Creamer steps in before Jack can make any contact. I say luckily because Jack could have really hurt J.O. if he had hit J.O. with full power there when J.O. wasn't expecting it. Um, so it looks like J.O. shaking it off. I believe, and again, we can't see the score, which is, uh, which is unfortunate, but I believe Jack still has a slight edge. Justin still needs to make this comeback effort happen just a little bit. We see both coaches, Kevin Walker on the left for All-Stars Jack Felton and Damon Gilbert on the right for Paul Mitchell and Justin Ortiz, both of them very animated, calling the points as they see them. Kevin Walker seems to think that that scored from Jack, but no call from the judges. Justin looks like he was trying to land the back fist while he was kicking. They don't call it. It goes to uh, Terry Kramer calls it in favor of Justin or sorry, Jack, excuse me. Terry Kramer calls in favor of Jack Felton. Looks like we're having another bit of an injury timeout here. Stoppage of the fight. Justin's back in. Trying to work that leg, trying to make something happen, scoring with the two point kicks. Jack goes to the ground. Reset, no calls there. That's the right call. There wasn't really anything happening there. Uh, Jack falls. Looks like he just tripped over Justin's legs. Justin might have gotten one of those kicks in there. Kind of looked like one of those kicks landed. And ultimately, nothing is called. Lots of action, but no call on that clash there. And then Justin goes for the jump spin back kick, a little bit of Raymond Daniels style. Uh, Jack smothers it, comes up over the top for the point. Maybe I was wrong about, about the score from before because I know that, that Justin at the very least forces overtime in this fight because, like I said, this is his uh, diamond ring winning performance. So maybe Justin had scored more early on than, uh, than we had given him credit for. It looks like he scores there, smothering Jack, going over the top, a flurry of techniques to make sure that he gets that point. Striking with insurance there for Justin Ortiz. Stoppage of the fight. Looks like this is a timekeeping issue. Uh, looks like the scorekeeper probably wasn't exactly sure how much time was left in the fight. So the center referee is going to get that figured out. Both coaches trying to make sure that the, uh, that the time uh, gets put on there properly so that they give their fighters the, uh, the best opportunity to find success here. And I believe that to win this match, you do have to win by two points. So it's very possible that Jack was kind of clinging to a one-point lead that wasn't quite enough uh, for, for regulation. And then Justin came back to obviously take the lead at the end. But we're going to see how that happens right now. Another point in favor of Jack Felton. Yeah, so when I was commentating earlier in the fight, when I was giving context, Justin must have scored more than I had realized uh, because Jack has kind of accumulated a lot of points here. Um, but as we know, Justin's going to come back and wind up winning this match. See Justin trying to work the, kin, Jack, uh, the kick again, Jack deflecting. And then it looks like J.O. might have gotten the body punch there. He does get the body punch. That appears like it might have been at the buzzer. So if that was a body punch at the buzzer, that very, that very well may have been the technique that forced overtime. Again, very hard to tell here without the audio and without the, oh, a lot of excitement there coming from Coach Damon Gilbert. They don't see anything. Looks like we might be in a sudden death situation here. Justin might be trying to get that winning point to pull away. We can tell by the emotion that Coach Damon Gilbert is showing. And then Jack goes to the ground that time on the kicking technique. Looks like nothing's going to get called. And as we can see, we're getting to the end of the video here. So it looks like Justin Ortiz is going to put this fight away with one final technique. Looks like that body punch is going to do it. We immediately see the celebration from Coach Damon Gilbert. Justin Ortiz overcome with emotion. Excellent fight, J.O., and congratulations on that huge win. One of the biggest wins uh, of Justin Ortiz's career and, and yeah you know not being able to see the the scorekeeping is difficult there but definitely seems that while I was kind of giving the context in the beginning Justin must have accumulated a little bit more of a lead there so maybe Jack was playing catch up early on at the end of the day uh, that fight would wind up going into what I believe was overtime it was a nine minute fight so I feel like that had to have been some some overtime rounds in there um, and then uh, ultimately Justin scoring that final body punch to secure the win. So now we're going to dive back into, I wanted to show that win of Justin Ortiz's. Now we're going to dive back into uh, kind of the European events and, and specifically looking at uh, performances from the Austrian Classics. Here we have Austrian Classics 2008. We have none other than Matt Immig. Uh, and I just, I love this form because he's in the point fighting uniform and it's not just any point fighting uniform. It is the point fighting shampoo bottle uniform. One of my favorite Paul Mitchell uniforms that has ever been produced. Uh, I would pay a lot of money to have this uniform. Um, but anyway, so we see Matt taking off here. 
excellent stances, good, clean, strong hand techniques, right into the tricking, coming out of it with the shuriken cork there, right into that signature vertical punch with the left hand chambered in the knife hand that Matt Imig was known for doing. Brandy to the statue, that's another classic Matt Imig signature move there, um, especially for this stage of his career, around 2008, um, around that time period is when Matt was doing a lot of the, the Brandy statues and his routines, did it at the U.S. Open as well. Cheat seven to the split there. Uh, rotating through Matt almost never used the kip up in competition. He preferred to use this kind of like spin technique to that spear hand, uh, which I thought was really unique. And the other thing that I love about that, just for some context, a lot of times when competitors, when Paul Mitchell competitors at least goes, go overseas uh, as forms and weapons competitors, we will actually wear the point fighting uniforms uh, just because we think it's cool. And because point fighting is so popular over there, um, a lot of the forms and weapons competitors actually wear kind of the more silky point fighting uniforms just naturally. That's what they always wear when they compete in forms and weapons. So I guess a, a little bit of a difference in the competitive culture there. Now we're going to see one of Matt's contemporaries, Mark. Mark Cannonizzato at the Austrian Classic. Once again, huge Jesus X out there at the beginning. Uh, Jesus because of the stall with the arms out and then the X out signifying the kick in the middle of the backflip. This is just one year later in 2009. We see Mark demonstrating his beautiful kicking ability there with that side kick in the introduction of the form, showing off great speed, landing that Webster and going right into the tricking combination. I love that. Using the Webster to kickstart the horizontally moving tricking combination. I think that's a really nice creative touch there. We see the jackknife. So more creative hand combinations showing off his speed here. Looks like he's going to set up for a flash kick variation. Absolutely. Tucks in first and then extends out for the kick towards the end of the technique. Beach twist roundhouse. Tiger mouth to the flare kick and then finishing up with the nice clean hand techniques into the intense key eye to finish things off. And that is the great Mark Cannonizzato. And the reason that I show those two forms from the Austrian classics, Matt Emig and Mark Cannonizzato, is because another one of our viewer submitted videos was actually a video that I had never seen before. It's a sportmartialarts.com video uh, of Matt Emig and Mark Cannonizzato going, uh, going against each other in a division all in one video. But before we get to that, when I saw that one video that I had never seen before from the Gator Nationals, I stumbled upon another video from the 2007 Twin Tower Classics of Matt Emig versus Mark Cannonizzato in weapons competition. So we're going to watch that one first because I feel like watching them go at it in weapons was a little bit more competitive than the other video of them that we're going to watch. Uh, but obviously that's for our viewers to decide. So we're going to go ahead and tune in to this uh, this Matt Emig nunchuck form here that's going to lead us into a Mark Cannonizzato comma routine. We see Matt with the choreography in the beginning. He was so skilled at being able to use the, the small manipulations of the chucks in his introduction, um, just as the, the cool, flashy little details um, that prepared you for the form that he was about to do. We see the inverted thumb spin there. That's a lot more difficult than I think that people would initially recognize. Uh, the gainer switch swing through gainer there, going back into the high speed chucks manipulations. Um, and if you've never watched Matt Emig before, that's the number one thing that you'll notice about watching Matt's routines um, is the speed that he has with his chucks. I mean, his, his creativity of manipulation, his diversity of manipulation, and then they're doing the pass between the legs coming out of the beach twist. I mean, some of the things that Matt Emig was doing with chucks was just so ahead of his time. Um, he was really a trendsetter for, for chucks. There's really never been anybody like Matt, and there probably won't be anybody like Matt in terms of a nunchuck competitor ever again because of how much of an innovator Matt was um, and the skill level that he had with that weapon. And now we see Mark Cannonizzato here taking on Matt Emig now with his comma form. We see that little release of the commas there, catching the commas as he goes into that Webster. Uh, Mark was always a master of the Webster. You can argue that was a signature move of his. His kicking is just so beautiful. The, the full extension of those long legs as he's throwing the kicks gives it a really unique look, especially when he was on straight up. As you can see here, he wasn't on Paul Mitchell yet. He was competing for teams straight up with the, uh, the purple gi top and the white pants. Seeing those kicks in the white pants just has a little bit of a different look to it. And I think that that's one of the things that that helped this Matt Emig and Mark Canada's excuse me, rivalry as they were trading wins back and forth, trading U.S. Open titles back and forth from tournament to tournament. I think it really is a major stylistic difference. It really just comes down to what the judges prefer watching more because of just how different Matt and Mark were. Um, they, they were so innovative. They were so um 
uh, they were so technically sound in, in the way that they would perform their routines. And so it really just came down to what judges prefer. Do they like um, the slightly slower, but maybe a little bit more technical um, with the full extension style of Mark? Or do they prefer um, the faster high speed power style um, that Matt always brought into competition? And I think that that's a, a big part of um, what fueled that rivalry was how different these competitors are. And so now we're going to move on to the video that was submitted by one of our viewers. Uh, this is from the Gator Nationals in 2011. Uh, this is reaching the end of both Mark and Matt's careers. And you see they're both still competing at the high level. Uh, and this is when Mark had his, uh, his signature mohawk that became a trademark of his once he made the move from straight up to Paul Mitchell. Really creative variation there with that uh, almost like a little bit of a breakdancing flair as he jumps down into that sidekick. Beautiful, powerful tornado kick there. And then obviously this is the creative forms division. So you won't be seeing any inversions, all creative kicking and hand technique, which means no rotations over, uh, over 360 degrees in the air and no inversions whatsoever, which is going to force the competitors uh, to be a little bit uh, more creative in the way that they put together their forms because they're limited in the amount of the acrobatic kicking moves that they can do. And so now we're going to transition to Matt Immig's form here. Literally, as soon as uh, Mark finished, it's Matt's turn. He was on deck. Gives the introduction, and he's going to back up here, and we're going to watch the great Matt Emig go to work one more time. Now, I'm going to pause this real quick before we watch this video, and I want to highlight some of the competitors in the background of this video as well. Over or Competitors are just significant figures in sport karate. Over to the far left side of the screen, I hope that the screen recording allows you guys to see my cursor here, but over to the far left side of the screen and the white holding the Coke bottle, uh, we have Will Cannonizzato, that is Mark Cannonizzato's dad, very influential figure um, in sport karate. Moving across this image some, we see Ross Levine in his full circle days right over Matt's right hand shoulder. So if you look over Matt's right hand shoulder, you'll see Ross Levine there. Then over to Matt's left, just peering over Matt's left shoulder, Kyle Potter, member of Team AKA, great CMX competitor. Kyle Montagna wearing the Change the Game t-shirt in the black uh, to the left. Uh, well, from our perspective, it's to the right of Kyle Potter. Um, and then next to him is Luke Palmer. Luke Palmer is actually a bow competitor who is, uh, he was very innovative with a lot of the tricks that he did um, throughout his career. So we're actually going to watch a video of Luke Palmer's. Uh, I think it's coming up here in just a couple of videos and I actually got the idea to showcase Luke Palmer um, from seeing him in the background here. Next to Luke, we also have uh, Hunter Crane, who uh, unfortunately passed away. Uh, it was, I believe, just a, a little over a year ago and uh, obviously a member of the Crane family. If you haven't seen the episode with uh, with Kalman Choka, um, Kalman gives a, a great, uh, tells great stories about, about Hunter and gives a, a great uh, testimony to him and his life and, and what he meant to sport karate. So I highly recommend uh, that anybody watching this goes and watches uh, episode 50 of the podcast featuring Kalman Choka as well. Uh, and then and speaking of Kalman Choka, we have Kalman Choka himself sitting down on the floor uh, next to Hunter there, followed by Joseph Vine over to the other side, another uh, influential member of Team Infinity. Uh, so lots of sport karate talent, lots of influential sport karate figures in the background. So I just wanted to point that out real quick. But now, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into this Matt Emig creative form. And we see once again... Huge stylistic difference from Mark. We're seeing big, powerful hand techniques as opposed to the more conventional high-speed chop punches where Mark would focus more on the extension. Matt would focus more on just the power and just trying to uh, really perform every single technique that he was performing. We see the illusion there. It's a hyper illusion landing on the kicking leg and then adding the next hop over hook coming out of that, jumping off the kicking leg, kicking with that same leg once again finishing with power, giving the judges one last look and then bowing. And I actually have no idea who won that division. <laughs> it turns out that in neither of those videos where they showed both uh, Mark and Matt, we have no idea who actually won there. And now we're going to transition, I believe, to that same Gator Nationals. Actually, no, it looks like this was a couple of years later because the previous one was the 2011 Gator Nationals. Now we're at the 2013 Gator Nationals. And this is Luke Palmer, who I was talking about. And the reason I paused the video here is because we're going to see him Start the form with a very difficult, very unique uh, Webster variation here as he's actually going to bend down and pick the bow up as he's going into that Webster. Check this out almost immediately. Very difficult to do that. 
landing nice and clean. And now we're going to see Luke Palmer go to work uh, with all of his creativity. I always enjoyed watching his routines. You know, I was in the uh, 13 and under division and 14 uh, early on into the 14, 17 division as Luke was competing in the adult division. It was always fun to watch his routines because of some of the crazy tricks he would go for just like this wrapping the bow around his waist as the bow comes around the waist, bumping it up into the air with his knee. Um, and that actually would be the inspiration for a move that I invented later on, where I would actually throw the bow above my head. And then when it came down, pop it with my knee and then go for the catch. We also saw him go for the box cutter throw and then do a sweep underneath, not just spinning around, but actually doing a full on sweep technique underneath the bow and then making the catch. Then they're standing the bow up vertically, wrapping the elbow around and throwing the bow with the elbow very unique and then showing off the difficulty with the 720 there so lots of just really unique skills being demonstrated there by luke palmer so luke if you're watching this hats off to you man really appreciate your creativity uh, and always be, being willing to think outside the box with a lot of your bow routines that's something that i respect a great deal now speaking of uh, thinking outside the box we're now going to move to another viewer submitted form uh, this one is cody sanders at the north american international karate championships the uh, naikc promoted by canel loveless and we're going to see cody sanders go to work with the tanfa tanfa typically a weapon reserved for traditional competition but we're going to see cody sanders here do a cmx creative musical extreme routine with the tanfa you're going to see that obviously doing a CMX routine, some of the striking is going to be traditional Tanfa striking. Some of it's going to be a little bit more uh, creative using parts of the Tanfa to strike that you wouldn't um, traditionally use. Like right there, we see him going into the tricks. Uh, and just the creativity to do some of these releases, catching the handle of the Tanfa compared to catching the striking end of the Tanfa. Um, very, very unique in his presentation here. And notice he's doing a lot of the traditional manipulation of the Tanfa as well. It's not like he's just holding them like commas and doing comma tricks or anything like that. He's actually using the Tanfa the way that they were intended to be used throughout, you know, I would say at least half of that form other than when he was doing the tricks. So hats off to Cody Sanders for that creativity there. And then now we're going to move on to yet another viewer submitted form. And I was actually really impressed when somebody submitted this one uh, from Steph Verserin, I believe is how his last name is pronounced, uh, because a lot of people don't know about Steph Verserin because he really didn't compete on NASCA very much. Obviously, this is at the U.S. Capitol Classics in 2009. Uh, I was actually there to watch this form as he was competing against one of my teammates uh, on the Premier Martial Arts National Karate Team, Kyle Montagna. Um, but actually, Steph Verser, uh, Verserin, he released a sampler years and years and years ago that I'm not able to find on YouTube anymore uh, that was set to a song called Freestyler. That was a huge inspiration for me early on and coming up with a lot of the bow tricks that I invented early in my career. Uh, I drew a lot of inspiration from that Steph Verserin sampler um, that he just posted on YouTube doing some bow tricks and having a good time. And it kills me that I cannot find um, the vid that, that sampler anymore. So if anybody, Steph, if somehow you watch this and you still have that sampler, please link it in the comments, send it to me, uh, because that, that was a huge part of, of my inspiration uh, becoming a, a bow staff tricking competitor. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, somebody did find this form. I believe it was Dax Hallen that pointed this form out to me. And so uh, now we're going to have a look at it. Uh, we're going to see some uh, some pretty nice tricks and creativity here in this routine. Um, but again, if you guys can find some of his samplers on YouTube, highly recommend going and watching those because that's what uh, was an inspiration for me early on. We see him going right into the striking combo. Pretty good extension on the striking. You know, a lot of times uh, competitors that are known for their tricks sometimes don't have the best striking technique. But we actually saw pretty good thirds position and extension there from Steph Verserin. See the neck roll going right into the ridge hand, low hand roll going right into the release combination, inverted catch there. Notice that he caught that with his left hand upside down. That's ahead of its time that people weren't doing stuff like that in 2009. We see the voodoo child. Now the voodoo child was more of a trademark 2009 move that was very popular. Competitors like Ricky Morris, Becca Ross, lots of competitors using uh, the voodoo child in their routines back then. And Steph Verserin with a very strong finish there. Um, hats off to Steph Verserin for a solid performance there. And now any time that we talk about competitors that don't get as much love as they probably should 
you know I'm going to bring up Connor Griffith. In my opinion, Connor Griffith is one of the most underrated competitors in sport karate history. Um, he did make it to the U.S. Open stage once where he would uh, be in an excellent, excellent showdown with Michaela Johnson, uh, where Michaela would wind up winning and Connor would wind up taking second. Um, so Connor did have his moments in his career, but overall, I feel like never really got the respect that he fully deserved um, for the competitor that he was. He was a teammate of mine on Change the Game. You'll actually see me in the background of this video at one point cheering him on. And so now we are going to check out Connor Griffith from the 2011 Lone Star Open going to work. And right here in the opening section, we're going to see one of my favorite moves of his. We see the striking combination. I can almost guarantee that he's performing this form to an Avenged Sevenfold song, his favorite band. He does the circus sliding off the shoulder there. And then here we go under the leg, catching under the leg, throwing and catching under the leg. Once again, just a, a crazy, crazy high level of difficulty there to do the throw under the leg, catch under the leg, spin around again, throw and catch under the leg one more time. Just incredibly impressive for him, him to be able to do that so consistently. He hit that move so often in his routine. We see the voodoo child there. Uh, now the under the leg pass and then the butterfly spin over the top. And now he's wrapping it up. You can see me. That's me, a young version of me over there to the right side of my, uh, my arms in the air to celebrate that performance. Um, so Connor, if you're watching this, I miss you, man. Um, and uh, congratulations on an awesome career. You know that you've got my respect. And speaking of change the game, I've mentioned all of the members of team change the game on this episode of the podcast. I mentioned Kyle Montagna's name, Michaela Johnson, Connor Griffith, and of course myself. And so now we're going to go to another viewer submitted video and we're going to check out the coach of team change the game, which obviously half of those competitors retired and half those competitors went on to, uh, to represent team Paul Mitchell. So that team is no more. Um, and I should not forget. We also had uh, Giselle Segura on that team for a while. She was a senior competitor for us uh, that did a good job as well as uh, Casey Welch. Uh, we had Casey Welch, who was a junior competitor for us at the time. Uh, so when I say the four members have changed the game, uh, I mean the four initial core members of myself, Connor Griffith, Kyle Montagna, and Michaela Johnson. And there would be a couple of others uh, recruited later on. But regardless, here is the coach of that team, member of Team Paul Mitchell, current forms and weapons coach of Team Paul Mitchell, uh, and the person who taught me how to compete in the first place. We have uh, the great Lauren Carney, TGLK. And so we see here, what tournament is this actually? This is Diamond Nationals 2002. We see Lauren using all of her creative striking abilities, full speed there. Um, one thing that, that was a trademark of Lauren was not just her creativity with her striking, but also her intensity. So you'll see her using a lot of suspenseful pauses in this routine, uh, just to bring a little bit of extra performance value to the form. We see the trademark release there that was uh, innovated by Casey Marks and obviously passed down to her student, Lauren Carney. And then we see the beautiful full extension forward strike there. And then that's another trademark, that little unwind to the knife hand strike. Beautiful stances here from Lauren. Full extension on the forward strikes, the thrust, big, powerful uppercut, putting that intensity on display, just like I said. And then right there, that was, a, that was another one of her kind of trademark manipulations, placing the bow on the shoulder and kind of spinning into it to grab it underneath and then take that into a striking combo. Um, that was always a really nice transition that Lauren had. And then one of Lauren's signature finishing moves with the over the head strike low and then the knife hand going up to the other side. And then now, speaking of Casey Marks, we are going to watch uh, Casey Marks go to work. So Casey Marks was Lauren's instructor. Um, so she is the instructor, my instructor, right? So another part of the lineage. And the reason that this is significant is that this is also the Diamond Nationals of 2002. So this is an instructor versus student showdown in this uh, weapons grand championship here at the Diamond Nationals, uh, which must be something that was just so incredibly special for both of them to have this opportunity. And what's very interesting about these two competing against each other is that unlike Mark and Matt, where sometimes it can come down to the judge's preference of style, Casey and Lauren had an extremely similar, almost an identical style to their routines. We see a lot of the same movements being used. We saw Casey on the knee earlier doing the unwind to the hit, and now we see Casey going for the release and one-ups Lauren a little bit there by going for the second release. Um, so maybe Casey went after Lauren in this competition and did that intentionally uh, as a way to step up her game, or maybe that was something that was choreographed all along. The world may never know, right? Um, but truly special to watch coach and student compete against one another. That is just a, a, a really, really special memory that I know that both of them have. And it's special for us as fans of sport karate to be able to watch something like that. And so now continuing to go back in the lineage. Um, so Lauren taught me, Casey taught Lauren, 
And Mike Bernardo is who taught Casey Marks the ropes of bow staff competition. The great Mike, uh, Mike Bernardo, the father of modern bow. Um, he's now heavily involved with WKC, the World Karate Commission up in Canada. Uh, they're doing excellent things for sport karate right now. And now we are going to see the man who started all, in a lot of ways, the man who is responsible for Bo Staff being as popular in sport karate competition as it is today. Because if there's no Mike Bernardo, you can argue that there's no Casey Marks who popularized Bo. You can argue that there's no Lauren Carney if there's no Casey Marks who helped popularize Bo. And then, you know, through, through a lot of the work that I've done teaching seminars and everything, um, you know, I was the next step in that lineage and Mike Bernardo was a huge inspiration for me. Um, so you can make a, a solid argument that Bo would not be what it is today without Mike Bernardo, this man right here. And just an innovator in so many ways. We see, obviously, this form is going to be predominantly traditional techniques. I believe this was from, uh, this, this demonstration has to be from back in the 90s or, or maybe even the late 80s. I'm not sure. Um, and this is a demonstration. doesn't look like this is a competition. And then we see uh, Mike Bernardo teleporting there, becoming two different people. Uh, so I don't know if that's an intentional camera effect or maybe that's just a, a glitch in the way that this old school camera was running. Nonetheless, really cool to see it that way. But like I I was saying you see a lot of the traditional techniques here but then you'll also see some creativity like that one arm tucking uh, tucking the bow under the one arm spinning around coming into the swing that is something that we see all the time in modern traditional weapons competition most competitors do that as a forehand backhand and then a tuck under the arm spin swing and strike we see mike bernardo he was the one who innovated that he was the one who kind of created that tuck around spin swing and into the forward strike and we still see that prevalent in competition today and then turbo takes a bow um for those of you that don't know mike bernardo also played uh turbo in uh wmsc masters and uh was also a, a lead role in shoot fighter and, and the sequel to that movie um and now we're going to move on the last two videos that we have for today we have somebody who was clearly influenced by Mike Bernardo's career. I don't know if he ever formally trained uh, with Mike Bernardo. So somebody that's familiar with Gary Waugh, um, definitely go ahead and fact check me on that in the comments if you know that he did train with Mike Bernardo, or maybe he was just inspired by Bernardo and had a, a similar style. Um, but Gary Waugh, a competitor that uh, unfortunately we lost too soon. Um, he, uh, he passed away tragically, um, uh, while he was still, you know, in a position to be a top competitor in the sport. And we see him here winning the U S open on ESPN two. Uh, again, I'm not sure on the year, uh, that this routine took place. Uh, but this is the U S open broadcast on ESPN two. Um, and we see so many similarities to Mike Bernardo's style there. There's the signature, what's called a monkey hop, the low thrust to one side, jump switching with the block in the other. And one thing that, that Gary was so well known for was his intensity, much like Lauren Carney, who I was speaking about earlier, um, to the extent that he said that the name of his form was intensity. In his introduction, uh, he would say, judges, my name is Gary Waugh. The name of my form is intensity. With your permission, will I, may I begin? Um, and intensity is what Gary Waugh embodies in, in all of his performances. Um, and just so, so special to still have this documentation of history here. We see the high speed manipulation of a behind the back pass. That was a big deal back in the day. I mean, this is before releases were prevalent in competition. So to do a high speed behind the back spinning manipulation like that, was something that was still relatively new to competition. Uh, and, and that got him a lot of difficulty points. And Gary Waugh would actually wind up defeating the incumbent champion, Mike Chat, in weapons with this routine. Uh, he got a couple of tens for this routine. We see the old school ESPN graphic there with the uh, like almost like the PowerPoint looking awesome logo coming up. Uh, and then now slow motion, we're going to see that pass behind the back. Really technique wise, not much different from the way that we do behind the back passes with the bow now. Many competitors prefer to do a left to right handed behind the back pass to set up a lot of right handed release techniques. Um, but obviously that one was a right to left handed. But other than that, really that technique is uh, relatively similar to what we see in competition today. And so here he's receiving the scores. And then shortly after he receives the scores, with, there is going to be an interview with him, which obviously there's no audio because I'm doing the commentary over the top here. But there's one quote that I wanted to share with everybody that he says there that I really, really appreciated because the interviewer asks the age old question, you know, you were really intense. And I know that's like part of the rules and everything, but why so intense if you're not fighting anybody like you're just up there doing a form? Why be so intense? And his answer was, you know, he talked about preparing it in the dojo and everything. But one quote that really stu stood, uh, stood out to me was he said, you got to stay in it 
or get out of the ring. And I just love that. I love that mentality of you got to be in it. You got to be all in. You got to be in that moment. You've got to compete like it's the last form you will ever run. Um, and trust me, saying it that way hits a little bit harder knowing, knowing that Gary would wind up passing away. Um, and if you're not going to give it your all, then don't show up. Don't step in the ring. So you step in the ring to give it your all every time. And that's exactly what Gary Watt did. Um, and that's why I have so much respect for him. And, and I go back and I, I watch this video in particular all the time as we get one more slow motion replay of the end of his routine here. And uh, now we're going to go ahead. And, uh, and we notice, by the way, the signature Mike Bernardo ending there. We noticed Casey ended her form that way. Bernardo ended his routine that way. And then we see Gary Waugh ending his routine that way as well. Um, so definitely a, a sign of the inspiration that, that and the impact that Bernardo would have had um, on Gary Waugh's career and that routine in particular. We're going to go ahead and skip past this ad here. Hey, at least it was a martial arts ad it looked like that time. And now for our last video of the day, we have the Mile High Karate Classic 1997, a special demonstration here from David Douglas and Gary Wow, I think that this is awesome. I had never seen this video until today. I was doing the final preparations to, uh, to put the podcast together. And I stumbled across this while I was researching Gary Wan. I'd never seen this before. Um, and this happened years before Lauren Carney and Casey Marks would do their synchronized routine with one competitor having the bow at times and the other competitor not having the bow. Now, I will say that Lauren and Casey are still innovators of that because they actually did the entire routine in synchronization with one another. If Lauren was doing a forward strike, Casey was doing a punch, so on and so forth. Um, we see a lot more asynchronous demonstrations demonstration or out of sync demonstration in this routine. Um, but it looks like this is just a demo. It's a special demo. It does not look, look, look like this is something for competition. So they wouldn't have had to meet that NASCA requirement of I believe it's like 75% of the form uh, being synchronized uh, together. And so we see them here, once again, kind of taking turns, right? We see as one is setting up a technique, David Douglas there. And then look, we see that signature ending from Gary Watt and then the double leg from David Douglas over the top. His hairband comes flying out as he's going through the tricking combination, hits the B-twist. Th this demo is just so cool. Like I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm fanboying over this demo. It's so cool to see. Look at the speed there from Gary Watt. That was something he didn't show us in that U.S open form incredible speed on the manipulations there holding that stance as david douglas hits his combo we go right back to gary wall now he's going to show off the release and notice that was a release to the inside that was a difference from what casey marks and innovated just two years before 1995 at the u.s open doing the release going pinky side up gary wad did that release almost looked like he was leading with the thumb, which is something that I thought was a newer innovation that I had started doing when I competed. But we see Gary Waugh, I'm gonna rewind this real quick just so that we can uh, just so that we can see that again. We see Gary Waugh going for a release off the thumb there. I think I rewound a little bit too far, excuse me for clicking around a little bit too much here. But look at this, it looks like Gary Waugh back in 1997, he's gonna come around from the behind the back pass after this David Douglas tornado kick hook to the chop punch and then reset now watch this he does the spin combo reverses it and then he rotates to the inside and he throws that bow off his thumb i think that's ridiculously cool because that was something that when i was just to give you guys a little bit of context for why i think that that's so cool releasing off the thumb is an innovation that that i thought that i had you know been one of the first people to do when i was just a kid you know because my instructor was teaching me to do the hand roll first and throw it from the hand roll but i i decided that i wanted to use the butterfly and so i just kind of started doing it with the butterfly spin technique and then from the butterfly i started throwing it off my thumb so i thought it was just my own little thing that i was doing and in a lot of the film study that i've ever done from the 90s through the 2000s, all of the release innovations that were happening in the early and mid 2000s, I never saw anybody else throw the bow quite like that off the thumb until now, 1997, I see Gary Waugh throwing the bow like that. So um, that's just something that was really special for me to see because, you know, it's, it's, it's such a cool part of the of bow staff history and the development of different bow staff tricks. Um, and, and Gary Waugh's impact on the sport is definitely still, uh, still felt even today. So in my opinion, great episode today. I loved this. I had a great time going through some of these old school sport karate routines. As always, for future film study episodes, if there is anyone that you guys, the viewers, have in mind that you would like me to do film study alongside, 
drop those names in the comments, send me those names and I will bring them onto the show and we will do film study together and we'll break it down. Or if there's more forms that you haven't seen me cover before or fights for that matter that you haven't seen me cover before that you would like to see covered on the show, go ahead, drop those links in the comments as well. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you to Black Belt Magazine for hosting yet another episode of the Jackson Rudolph podcast. This has been episode 56 and I'll see you next time.